Well, it's hmm, the 10th of May. Yes, well, I mean, the plants are loving it. The trees are all in full kind of green mode and the bluebells are out. Not that you can see them through these windows, but it's bloody cold. But there you go, that's, um, <clears throat> that's Great Britain for you. Um, so what we've got here today is Mark's Gordon Smith. Um, and it's, it's this uh, lovely sort of um, quilted maple neck, um, brass nut. I, you can see I've masked off the fingerboard already and marked up the frets. And this is an interesting one because um, Mark originally contacted me and asked, how, asked if I would do a, a refret on this guitar. And so I said, of course, um, you know, send it down. And we got, we got talking. And I, I sort of tried, I tried to find out what, what was not working. It sort of even Stevens down the board. But this E string falls off the end too much. Now, I kind of looked at all the different possibilities. So when you think about string positioning, um, You've, you've got, it could be an alignment problem. It might be that the strings just need to be, um, you know, uh, the same spread. Sometimes with a, a Strat style guitar, you can um, slacken off the bolts and crank the neck a little bit and get it into a better alignment. Sometimes if absolutely necessary, and it's not a big deal, this is a hard tail bridge. So in this case, it's actually quite simple to fill the original holes and reposition the bridge, for example, to get another millimeter out of it, which may make a difference. Well, the idea of the refret was, Mark was hoping that uh, I could refret the guitar and put, or refret it with less um, sloped uh, fret ends um, to kind of gain back maybe um, a little bit of space. Now, I did a had a look at that, and actually, about the only amount of space you could really gain back, even if the fret ends were practically vertical, would be about half a mil, three quarters of a mil maximum. So I didn't think that was going to be uh, a good solution because it's going to be expensive. It's going to possibly tear up some of this finish here because um, uh, they, what they've done in the Gordon Smith, they've, they've well, they fretted it the old-fashioned way. So at least I think they've, well, all the time, the pretty way they've they've. Um, they've done it this way. They've, they've, thingamajig. They've um, finished the, uh, mm, yeah, gloss finished the neck, and then they fretted on top of it, just like I did the other day on this. How about that, Gordon Smith and me? Look, we're, we're buddies. Da da da. Only I'm using king size dots here, but that's anyway. So, they've done it that way, which is great. I like to see it that way, and it feels better, and it doesn't have the. Um, the old uh, sort of carpet effect where you can see the kind of crinkling in the light because the, the finish has gone over it as a, almost like a carpet over the frets. So that's cool. Um, but even still, pulling frets out of such a nice, shiny, uh, glossy fretboard is going to be not without some damage or some scuffing or little marks around the edges. It's impossible to do it. So that that was a kind of high price to pay for something where I couldn't, be certain that it would solve his problem. And then what would we do after that if it didn't? That would be a lot of money to throw at it. So I had thought about it a bit longer and I had a look at um, different options. So the first thing I thought, well, I hadn't realized to begin with that it was, a, I hadn't seen the bridge, so I, I didn't realize it was a hard tail. So once I realized it was a hard tail, I thought, well, actually there's probably gonna be some more options here for different um, spacings, because this is 52.5. Um, and so I went off looking for bridges um, with a 50 mil spacing. Now, there practically aren't any that you can get commercially with 50. But also, 50 is a bit sort of, it creates another possible problem, which is, what, what if I don't like the 50 spacing? Now, I, I, that's a perfectly um, valid uh, consideration. And, and one of the things I tried to assure Mark is that taking in a total of um, uh, two and a half millimeters at this end would translate into incredibly tiny amount of movement along here. And certainly by the time you get to this end, since the 
the nut slot points will be at exactly the same place as they were before. The actual difference in spacing is will be a beyond small, so you really wouldn't be able to feel it. But uh, it's still a kind of a bit of a final thing. So in the look for different bridges, what I found was a um, ABM bridge, um, which is a bit of a sexier looking thing than this. This is quite traditional. But the ABM bridge has movable, little movable saddles that allow you to go from, I think it's 56 down to 50. So I thought, well, that's a possible. And at 114 quid, it was cheaper than a refret. And it would at least give Mark some flexibility to go maybe one mil in, two mils in, you know. And also, if you wanted to, to um, bias it all towards space on the top E, but not so much on the low E, because we tend to pull downwards, or we, we tend to be pulling that way on the low E, um, then you could give this back another two, two mils or two and a half mils and keep this kind of where it is. Um, and, and so, you, you know, weight stagger all the all the savings onto this side so and you can change it back and experiment so i thought actually as a it, it would be a pretty good solution and what i also did yesterday or the day before is i kind of physically yanked all these strings all the outside strings and i brought them into exactly 50 millimeter millimeter spacing now of course they weren't perfectly then spaced with the other ones but um what we got out of it was a experiment so i could play some melodies on the single string uh, and I felt that it made a significant difference, and I, I was able to conclude, as far as you can know, I concluded that that would solve the problem. So it seemed to me the best of the solutions, so that's what I recommended that um, Mark go for. Now, you'll notice this is a, a thin nitro finish, so it's, it's kind of designed, and I know that Mark kind of wants it to wear naturally, so it's got some, it's got some, um, I can't really see, it's got some, bits already sort of chunked out of it. So I think the idea is that this all kind of wear and relic on its own. So um, I don't need to panic too much about it. What I did warn um, Mark of in the first place um, before I knew about this deliberately thin nitro finish with the desire for it to relic is I, s I got a bit of a you know shock when I saw uh, the gloss finish on a maple neck because the last time I saw one of those on a Gordon Smith it all fell off so we just have to be <laughs> uh, conscious of that and I had to refinish the neck which was a major pain in the what's it um, so you can't do the fret work without using masking tape you can de glue it as much as you can but at some point if this finish is built to fall off if Gordon Smith has a similar problem to some of those um, Mexican uh, fenders, then you're not going to get away with it. Uh, it'll just come off. So I did warn um, Mark about that. And I have always warned other customers. And it seems a bit hysterical sometimes and frightens some people. Um, but there is a tiny percentage chance of that happening. Now, it seems to have narrowed down. In my experience, it's, I've only had it happen on a number, a worrying number of made in Mexico gloss maple boards. Um, and I've had it happen once before on a Gordon Smith gloss maple fingerboard. So that being said, um, my plan then was to, uh, we were going to switch to um, a tusk nut and a tusk string tree and then go for this chrome and brass looking bridge, which was a nice replacement of that. may require a little bit of changing around here we may, may need to fill a hole or two here or whatever and drill some new ones but that's fine to to make it a, a permanent fixture um i before uh, while i was doing this stuff off camera i had a little tap at this nut and it was no way it was going to come out now that puts me in a, a worrying sort of situation i'm not t i'm not comfortable trying to well uh, i the chances are there's a number of things could happen. Um, either I grind this nut out or you know, dr dremel it out, which will take quite some work because it's brass. Um, I don't think it will tap out and I don't think it will lever out without possibly damaging this lovely finish around here. So it, it's not exactly broken, therefore don't exactly fix it. So I'm going to err on the side of caution because the last thing I need to do for Mark and for myself is in pursuing a slight bit 
better um, friction-free material, which I'd much prefer tusk to brass, even though brass is, looks great. The problem is that brass is a signature thing of Gordon Smith guitars, um, and so if I take that out and it causes some damage and we end up with, well, a nice black tusk nut as far as the friction is concerned, we've kind of made damage, we've lost a characteristic Gordon Smith feature and so on. It's, it, I'm not sure if it's worth doing that or running that risk because you just, you know, when you've got a brass nut absolutely tightly glued in there, there is not a lot of ways of getting that out without damage other than by cutting this. And, and I know Mark already said to me that uh, he wanted to keep that nut for possible replacement. So even if I changed it to Tusk, we might, you know, he might want to go back to it at some date or if he sold the guitar or whatever. So it started to look like, let's go with it. Now, if I do need to do any height adjustments here or widening, I'm going to do it with my trusty doofers. Um, it just will take longer and I have to just be more patient with it. So I thought what I'm going to do with this then is actually choosing the bridge aspect. It simplified things, um, choosing to go the bridge way of solving the fret, uh, the string slipping off problem, um, kind of made it easier. So what I thought I'll do is today I'm going to do the sort of mechanical fret level business, um, pre precision leveling, um, sanding and polishing out and making sure the nut's right, get the target action right and getting that sorted. Um, and then park it for a couple of days while the bridge comes in, which I ordered a couple of days ago, but it will, it's been bank holiday, so it will take a, a few more days to come in. And then it'll be a matter of just concentrating on this end and then restringing once that bridge is on and setting the dimensions um, where we want. So, um, about the neck on this thing, um, did I find anything unusual? Well, it's out of tune. Um, I don't want to play too much because I don't want to rub off the black marker, but let's just tune it. And we only need it broadly tuned. So, I set the action <laughs> uh, just now. Off camera. <laughs> okay, these strings are a bit dead, so it's not giving you a, a good account of this guitar. So what I'll be doing now is I'm going to level it with the strings at 52 and a half mils, because that really doesn't bear any, that doesn't have any bearing on the leveling part of it. So. Um, that, that means we can do that bit now, which is great. So uh, I've got the action where I want it at one and a half mils. It's a nine and a half inch radius. Um, it's got a tiny bit of, um, it's got about 2.2 mils, which I think is a good start point, And it's certainly that's what Mark's been used to. We'll start with that. So action at this end is where I want it. The action at this end now will just sort of do a sort of check and see what I'm most concerned about is the um, free running <laughs> strings. And I think Gordon Smith, I don't see any reason why they wouldn't be good at that. These are actually, I would say they're close enough to not worry about for now. Um, they're, they're pretty spot on and that's, that's excellent. This guitar, um, somebody put a shim in the neck of it and I've got it to the action I want. And to get it there, these things are standing miles up on their um, high heels. So I think this, really shouldn't have the shim in it. So it shimmed it, which is forcing those saddles to go up. Now somebody has concluded in the past that it needed to do that, but if you look at how far into these things the grub screws have gone, that's unhealthily, that's nearly falling out the other end. So I'm, I'm going to level with this because that's fine. The action is still the action, even if it's you know, currently shimmed and this um, lifts the bridge to meet it. It's still going to behave, the neck's still going to behave the same way. What I'll then do afterwards is I'll take the shim out and we'll look at resetting it up the same. Um, let me think, shall I do it? Uh, yeah, we'll do, we'll do it before I recrown the frets. Yeah, because I can probably leave the strings. Sorry, I'm just thinking out loud. We'll, yeah, do it before I crown the frets because then we can leave the strings on, put a uh, that thing capo across and take the neck off just enough to get the shim out, put it back on and then see where we are. Right, so that's tonight's thing. I'm going to hang this. Oh, just uh, the reason I have this around 
is because I sprayed with some other, uh, I put some spray can polyurethane on straight on top of some uh, hand applied mm, Minwax water based stuff. And because the reason I wanted to experiment with that is because in the fretting process, I put some little tiny scratches on here that really depressed me because I'd gone to so much trouble to make it beautiful and, and, and it looks good at a distance, but the tiny little production marks bugged me. So I thought what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, experiment with this can of, I think it's Rust-Oleum, but that went straight on as a, a finish. Um, and it's no sanding or anything. So I think I can put another layer over all of this and just have the thing. Now, I know it goes against my thing of spraying over the frets, but uh, I think in this case it will, it will just clear up those little um, marks. It's, it's the spray is gloss enough straight out of the can, which is unusual. Anyway, we shall see. I may regret it, but that neck isn't doing, isn't for any project. It's just waiting for a body to come along sometime. So we've got the action down here, albeit shim plus these things standing on their hind legs. We've got neck relief and we've got first fret action. That's all we need for um, doing the leveling. When I played this at home, it chokes out quite quickly on uh, notes down here. Well, it's, it was, maybe I've gone up a little bit higher, but it's got some zinging there and it was choking out somewhere out here. So we've got some to take care of and then on the base side it's not too heavy on the fret slap so I think it's going to be it's going to be it's going to turn out well. Um, now it's a little bit um, a bit different in that I'm uh, I don't normally s calibrate the thing with the paper uh, the masking tape on and you might say well there's tiny fraction difference. Yes there is but I don't think it will make enough difference to the shape of the neck. Now, oop, there goes my thing falling apart. Right. So what I'm looking for is, um, this is actually showing us really straight for some reason. I, I'm a bit surprised because when I looked down it, that showed like it had some relief. But let's just check if it's got a different amount on each side, which would not be a healthy thing to find out because I can really do without that. Oh God, it has. It's one of those. Uh, so, what have we got? Uh, I don't know exactly what we've got. We've got a difference in relief, so it's flat, completely flat on this side, um, which means I'm not getting any curvature to to calibrate this thing. Now, we either add in some relief which I've covered up the wheel um, or we just see if we can calibrate it as almost flat as it stands there yeah that's just about as, that's as loose as this will go we'll work with that okay so here we go we're getting our bits ready um, I, I played it this morning and I thought the pickups were quite they were very um, low powered um, and, and quite sweet sounding but I, I wasn't used to them being quite so underpowered but that's just that's just me a personal preference really um, so but they are uh, they, as it happens they're a long way from the strings that's in the current kind of configuration so um, and I'm kind of thinking that may well be the way Mark likes to have them um, you know based on the Let's see, we've got high spots here. Look, you can see it building up some dust. So that's why those notes were zinging out when bending here. So having a, a very flat neck plus a high spot there is going to make those notes not play very well. Um, so the thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put the string back in and we're going to check it by auditioning it with our fingers and ears. Not bad. I'm going to do a tiny bit more at this top half, but so this is this is a sort of bump in this section here. We've got a little high here, a low, a, quite a high here, and then we've got a low spot here. Nothing's cutting really in this area 
here and then a bit of cutting right on the end. So we've got some ups and downs and that's what's great about this method is it shows me uh, what's going on. But it's, it, you know, it sounds drastic, but it really isn't. The, this ups and downs business is very, very uh, slight. And, and so the little bit of leveling will take care of that um, without hardly removing any material. This is 400 grit. Um, you can see that is a that is quite a high spot in the middle. Um, but we're taking it, taming it. And you notice that with this method, we are taming it with the strings on and the neck loaded. And I like this method because, and that's high, right on the end here, the last bit is high, very high. Um, I like this method because it, um, for a couple of reasons, it's more accurate. And the reason it's more accurate is because, struggling on that one, you see. Um, it's more accurate because not only is the neck slightly curved, the way it is in real life when you play, but it's also um, compressed in this direction. And that does cause, or that's what puts some of these little humps and hills and valleys, as I call them, into your guitar neck. Now, if you level frets with the neck off or the neck, uh, the truss rod adjusted so that neck is flat um, and relaxed, I suppose you might call it, then your you're not, uh, then you then you restring it. What was, what you've leveled perfectly flat a minute ago, uh, suddenly becomes a sort of hills and valleys. You can see the dark area here and here. Two, two, one spot there, one there, and one there. So we've got down in between, valleys in between. Yeah. So um, doing it with with the neck um, strings off and the neck flattened. It's great. It's about 95% more accurate than not doing it at all. But the extra little bit of accuracy comes in when you also put the neck under compression in the longitudinal um, plane. That last high fret is messing up, messing around with this, with this um, end of it. So I'll do a tiny bit more. So I'm, uh, the thing about um, wh whether I'm whether I'm confident about the amount of ma material I remove in this process, that really does have to come with experience. So it, it's not uncommon for people uh, who've bought my ebook and try this method. Well, it actually is uncommon, but there have been people, and I, I expect people who buy my ebook and try this method um, to come back to me and say, "I'm really nervous about this. Um, you know, what's happening? Is it? Am I doing it right?" To show you how just how bad that last fret is, look at that. That is quite significant. And then we've got these frets in the middle cutting up. We've got a low spot here, nothing cutting, and a low spot, sorry, low spot here, nothing cutting. So very high, middle, low spot, higher in the right in the center here. High at the end, low spot, high in the middle, low, slightly low spot, and then high at the end. So it's um it's an interesting one so i'm just going to zoom back out it's not at all uncommon for necks to have this many and sometimes even more ups and downs in them so um, and sometimes that that can be a marker of how good a quality the neck is but sometimes it isn't related to it you can get you know quality guitars like a well-made guitar like this gordon smith and they can just they will just have those ups and downs I think it's what the wood does under this longitudinal tension that you can't predict. I mean, yes, you could say a quarter sawn grain, for example, may, you know, prevent or it may make it sort of compress evenly, possibly um, the way we might say that grain, quarter sawn grain that's all going in the same direction um, dries more evenly and, and doesn't warp as much or twist. That's a fact that we know to be reasonable uh, it's a reasonable kind of statement about wood borne out by experience um, but as as to whether um, better grain prevents any ups and downs I don't know we haven't done any experiments to see but maybe it would but somebody might come along and argue exactly why it wouldn't See that little low spot here, 
is um, just sort of creating a tiny little bit of frazzle at that end. And again, this is my description of uh, not what I would call high frets, but it's uh, just a little bit of um, a little bit of uh, well, the l the little ditch up here makes the following frets just that little bit high, relatively speaking, and that's what's causing it to just zizz a little bit. Sorry for all these technical terms. Okay, so I've done my first three strings, and what I'm going to just check now is whether I bend across and everything works. Now, this is a very low action. Nearly through. Now, I'm bending in the, in the ditch, and that's a problem. Um, if you bend in a ditch, your, your string has to go uphill out of this ditch. So not actually bad. It's just zizzing on the top edge. Considering that there is a ditch there, which you can't really level out without taking more, a fair bit more wire, uh, fret wire or fret metal, I'm going to park it there and consider that better than it was, or declare it better than it was. So I'm happy with the improvement. Um, so I'm just going to um, brush off. This is a pretty almost brand new bit of. Um, I think it's only done one setup before this piece of sandpaper, so it's very new, so that should be good for a few more. So now I'm, I'm still looking to um, map this curve, and it's, it's looking flat in the middle still, so, okay, that's not bad, we can still do the levelling. Um, okay, um, as to why one side uh, you know, is and this again, this comes down to the grain thing as to why one side of a neck has no relief in it and the other side has some. Um, I, I try to visualize it sometimes. One side's flat, the other side's baggy, and somehow the wood does that from this side to that side. I can't really explain it. It's hard to visualize it, let alone explain it, but I'm sure somebody uh, would know how to. But the only thing you can really say with confidence is that it registers uh, relief on one side and none on the other. And that's all you can really say with your, with authority. Um, and you have to deal with it. And so often with a guitar like that, the only way you can deal with it is to um, compromise, I suppose you could call it, between the two positions. So you, you sort of set a halfway position. So if there's no relief on that side and you think it needs a bit, you put a bit of relief in and you tolerate the fact that you've created a little bit more on the base side, which already had some, um, because you can't you can't really do any different if you want some relief on the treble side. And it's a bit like the you know when you're working with the Telecaster with the the double saddle, the two strings per saddle thing, you know, where it has a a fixed intonation relationship. You you can't do anything else with it. You just go with the intonation. Uh, step that it gives you and if you find it needs something else you you're basically stuck you can't do anything with it you have to you have to kind of compromise somewhere between the two fixed positions so now on the bass strings here what you usually find um, often find is what I call as you get down to these wound strings you can see that there's very definitely these three high spots and we're barely touching in between and and Unless you get down a little bit, you aren't going to start to bring those two levels together. And if you don't bring those levels together, what happens is you'll fall into a hole when you're trying to fret a note or bend a string. And it's falling into the hole when you have a, I guess the thing I've said on many other videos is when you have a, a low spot, a low fret, it's as bad as a high fret. It's not bad now. A little there, a little bit there as a result of that one. Um, yeah, low fret will create the same effect as a high fret. So if there was one single high fret standing out, we know that a note played on the fret before it, we know the high fret will get in the way and cause it to buzz. Um, but if you had, uh, if all the frets were level except one was really low, then you fret on that low one and it will effectively make the following one really tall. And so you'll get the same buzz or choke uh, as if the fret was actually tall. So it's just about the relative levelness. So 
you know, that one being tall ca causes buzz. This one being short makes this one relatively tall in, re in relation to that one. Uh, so it's exactly the same effect. Um, and the slightly challenging thing about the, um, the low fret is, as you s s sensed from these clusters of high and low frets, uh, is that you have to kind of bottom out the, um, the difference between them to, to alleviate the effects. And the effects of either individual high and low frets or the, the clusters of high and low frets, uh, the effect is that you run out of space and you get what I call fret slap, which is where the strings, because of the hills and valleys, the strings don't have quite enough uh, room to move. And as a result, um, you get that kind of clattery sound that basically follows notes all the way up a certain a fair big patch, not, not individual notes. It, the fret slap tends to be on great half of the, key, uh, the fretboard keyboard. Um, so with this hill, hills and valleys business, it always is a matter of a sort of compromise of leveling the high, the hill, a little bit down to meet the valley, just as when we tackle a single high fret, we're, we're bringing that one fret down closer to the other frets in its vicinity. Um, and of course, you, you can uh, stick with it and, and take it all the way down until it levels out. Um, but you have to weigh it up against the cost in metal, obviously. So that's done, you know, this one or two frets where there's quite a bit of work, especially these last ones up here. Um, but overall, that's out of tune now, but that's, um, I think, pretty good. last fret it is quite high still but I don't want to hit it much harder um, we've got a we've got 1.5 last fret action on this which is a tiny bit higher than I would normally like for a 9.5 radius so again it what it shows us is that there are there are some there are some one or two um, significantly tall frets in this game which are dictating how how far we can bend. Um, so it's not uh, there's one of these two getting in the way of that bend just slightly. Um, now the only way to really take care of it is, is to go back, and I might just uh, to attempt to do a little bit more down this end, so we can we can just keep it and not go any higher than 1.5 because that's the that's the sort of low action that I like. 1.2 on the high E is my preferred actions. So I'm just going to try and um, tame that far end bit there. Now this is st this is just still a little bit on the flat side altogether. This neck. And we could put some um, we could put some relief into it, but if we put relief into it, all that happens is we then bend the, the tool to match the relief. Of the neck, so it doesn't matter if we change it later. If we level it now, it's flat. We can change the relief afterwards if, if I want some more. Um, when we've got all this uncovered and we've got access to the heel adjuster, so you know, I'm just filing it that I probably want to put a tiny bit more relief into it once this is done. And again, you know, I, I know from experience that doesn't change any of the parameters. It's something you can do. And it won't change, it won't make a difference on anything else we've done. Now I've just done that G, what I call the G track, a little bit more, because that's the one 
that will free up the bends, if any. Just about. Okay, I'm going to leave that there. So, next I'm going to do is I'm going to just slacken the strings a minute. Now this is where I'm going to test out the um, business of removing the shim. No point having it in there if it's not doing anything. I'm not quite sure. Well, I know why somebody put one. Um, get this the right way around. I know why somebody put one on there. Uh, Mark told me that he'd uh, originally couldn't adjust the action down to where he wanted it. There was no lee, no scope for it on the saddles. The high E was bottomed out, and that, that's interesting to, to hear that what just one. Uh, just one part of the bridge is it bottomed out. Now this is this is going to be tricky because we've got this paper everywhere. Um, why? I'm, the reason I wanted to do this now is because I wanted to be able to. Uh, so yeah, I can afford this to come off. So yeah, I wanted to be able to um, uh, have the strings on because. After this, the strings won't be on for a while. So I'm just going to lose this for the time being, uh, just so that I can take off the neck. And I'll just make these will come apart as well. So just bear with me. This won't be pretty as I this. get to this from the back. Um, so I'm just, the reason I, I've just kept the strings held is that I want to. I don't want them all falling off the uh, tuner posts if I can help it. I do need to get the whole plate off the back with the screws because I've got to take the neck off far enough to get in there to the shim. The shim I saw before was a piece of um, uh, sandpaper or something. So you can see I'm able to take that off like that, put it to one side, everything's still attached. So it's a very thin piece of sandpaper. Um, but I. I don't think it's necessary. Now we can always replace it with something very thin as well, but they've stu stuck it down. So I have to try and persuade it to lift up. It doesn't make it actually easy, terribly easy to move it on. Come on. Okay, that's not so bad. So that's just a thin little piece of uh, sandpaper. So we'll take that off, and I'm just really what I want to do here is I want to com um, confirm to myself uh, that this has to have this shim that's been placed. Now I'm obviously going to get a bit messed up here now because I need these bloody bits of sticky stuff out of the way so I can fit this in. Don't want them clogging up. Now I'm going to get the strings back in place. This is all just save me save preserve the strings so I can do this test. So we get this back in on the target and make sure the bits of sticky tape are out of the way before I lock it in place. Okay. <sighs> change, change, change direction. So shims out. What will, that will happen now is that the neck, uh, the strings will lower suddenly. Um, We'll see. Sorry, this. What are we talking about? Um, yes, we should be able to lower our strings. That's the whole point. Okay, uh, I've got most of my paper on there, so I can still. Um, do the stuff I need to do. So that shim coming out means I'm now too high, which is what I want. I want to take these down a little bit. So let's just get them tuned up to pitch again.
Okay, so that's cool for this for the time being. Now we've got too high an action, as we know, but let's now take this down um, and see how much better it sits because we're not lo we're no longer standing right up on its hind legs, and it's m it seems much better. And I I don't think this ever needed a, a, a shim in the first place, to be honest. So this is now sitting down much better um, but I can't really see. I'm going to do this first bit by um, guesswork because I can't see exactly. So 9.5 should be fairly flat. He says convincing himself. I got another one of those comments today somebody saying um, you should just shut up and get on with it or something to that effect. And I, I always enjoy replying. Sometimes I just hide people from the channel like that. Oh, let's not do that. Um, sometimes I just hide people. But sometimes I just also like to say to them, you know, this, this works exactly how I wanted it to, this format that I use. Um, uh, 1.5 there. Yeah, just I like to remind or to tell people what they don't necessarily know that it works absolutely fine for me, um, and you know I if they only knew how fine it works for me, they obviously wouldn't. They wouldn't, or if they were doing the same thing and it worked perfectly fine, there's no way they would change it because they it would be doing exactly what it want they wanted it to do, and that that's exactly what um, you know my videos on YouTube do for me. And of course, they're not for everybody, and of course. My, you know, just like in real life, my personality or whatever, lack of, um, might annoy some people, but that's their business to be annoyed or not. It's got nothing to do with me. Um, and if they don't want to be annoyed, they should not look at my videos. That's the, the much simpler thing. And I just find it, I always find it amusing when they take time to tell me that I must do this thing because they, and the, the, it just cracks me up that the sort of arrogance, the ego behind it, tells them that, well, they're right. They know how videos should be. And therefore, their rightness makes it absolutely important that they stop and correct me, right? put me right in the world, because they're right, and I'm obviously wrong. And that just it cracks me up. This obviously, well, w what kills me is that they, they couldn't for a second... Um, imagine that this works. You know, the, the reason I do it this way is shock horror. Not because I'm an idiot that needs putting right by you. But I do it this way because it works. And the funny part is, so that didn't need a shim in the first place. Weird, eh? Um, yeah, uh, the funny part about all this right and wrong stuff, you know, when people tell you that, assume you're doing something wrong and then take take it upon themselves to correct you, put you right, because you obviously didn't know. Is the one thing that sadly never occurs to them before they correct you and you know look like an arrogant fool. So it never it never occurs to them to ask a question about it. You know, like for example, and I, it's one of those things I I try to live by and I try to recommend to people. You know, if if it strikes you that you if, you, if you see something and your urge is to go, oh, you absolute muppet, don't you know that, and we all have that urge, we all have that urge sometimes, and I've had it more when I was a youngster and thought I knew stuff and thought it was my place to tell people that I knew better than them, so I, you know, I'm only saying this because I recognise it, but, um, you know, I try now, practice, 
the discipline of if I think somebody's got it wrong, before I go out and attempt to make myself look good at their expense, I try to um, I try to ask a question. So if I think that if I think they really have got it wrong, I try to make myself say something like, you know, does that does that is it can that work that way or is I'm, am I missing something? You know, and, and you can, fr I can usually phrase it in a way that, you know, accepts that I could be missing the point or wrong or whatever. So I'm not telling them, you know, sometimes they, their answer shows that I'm technically right. They, they didn't think of this thing and, and, oh, you know, maybe they learned something or maybe they come back and they tell me, um, you know, no, actually, it, what I didn't show you is I get my blah, blah, blah from advertising or, and that's not visible on here, but it really works, and therefore I wouldn't change it. You know, and then I learned something that I didn't know before. Um, but the sad thing about firing off the cannons to be so smug and, and smart and correct, and to win on points that way, is you don't learn anything, or you, you pass up the chance to learn anything, which is a, which is a pity. Now, the funny thing about this um, bridge is, of course, I'm we're going to be taking it off. So the, uh, the question of whether it kind of worked perfectly um, or needed shimming or whatever at the time is just moot in some ways. Um, and we may, you know, for example, if the next bridge is, uh, the next one is uh, the higher or lower, I can't figure it out in my head. But if it's different from this one, we may still have to shim it. But the guy, the person, guy, I assume, the setter-upper who did it the first time technically didn't need to do it um, because they did it with this bridge, not with a new one. And they, you can see I've set this back down. We've got about a, mi two, a, mil, a full millimetre before it hits the deck here, and that was at the right action. So, um, no, I understand if they, if, if, if they were told, look, I want you to lower, I want to get it even lower um, and... and Therefore, they figured out, well, Christ, the guy wants it lower. How do I get it lower? Well, you get it lower. You get it lower by raising the thing. No, what did you say? What kind of lower? Yeah, you, you raise the... You, to, cr to get the lower action, you would raise the neck. So you'd shim it to do that. And that's probably the only way out of it that you could see. Um, if I'm saying he... If he, if he um, wasn't studying the problem a bit more in, de in depth... Anyway, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to remark the frets, and the job now is to recrown them so that um, we're going to now put take the flat spots which are on the frets on all of them to some degree, um, but more so on some of these final ones up here, um, and we're going to uh, file off the or round off the sharp edges of the flat spots to return the shape of the fret back towards being an arch-shaped thingy, which is what it should be. Um, so it's pretty straightforward, but it uses this great uh, Stumac tool. Now this thing claims to have ultra-jumbo frets on it. Um, oh, was it? No, it isn't this one. Sorry, it's not this one. My mistake. This, is, this looks medium-ish to me. Um, no, it's another one that came in today that's got ultra, ultra frets. So we're going to do this on the medium. So the Stumac tool um, allows me to gently work the top of the fret and as it cuts away at the, the sort of flat spot or rounds it off, it still retains this nice little strip of black marker pen down the centre and my job is to round off as much of the flat stuff so basically make the shiny cut metal come in towards the centre and stop um, while there's the thinnest possible line. And the reason I stop there is because it tells me I've rounded the fret off without um, hitting the center of the fret or the top of the fret, which means I haven't changed the height of the fret at all, but I have changed the, the shape of it. Now, some of these the, these frets have been leveled um, more than some. Uh, so this is definitely uh, required some leveling um, and I know I think Mark originally wanted um, the previous tech to do some leveling and they didn't um, uh, pr they probably didn't charge for it anyway but um, 
you can see from having done this leveling here that uh, the frets in conjunction with the sort of the ups and downs of the neck under load you can see this has required some leveling and of course the great thing is once you put it under load again all the ups and downs will return but this thing will be leveled as close as possible um, with those bumps and hills and valleys if you like in taken into consideration um, which is a which is a neat thing about doing it this way now just when we have to do quite a lot of rounding off you have to be careful that the tendency or the likelihood is this um, the edge of the file can sometimes go down on to cut through the paper you have to just watch out for that and you see that I'm cleaning the diamond surface diamond coated surface cutting surface of the file uh, as I go because the I don't want the black marker pen to clog it up um, sometimes if you want an unused surface you can take the flat edge and you get a, a bit of a, a cleaner run at it with less likelihood of clunking out on the ground but the curved end is very useful for uh, as you can see getting in at this angle and it's much it's actually better for going in on the end of frets uh, when they go over the body like that and particularly on less pulls so you could really do the whole of your um, recrowning with a flat side of this and if I did I'd probably find that it's a lot newer than um, the other end because I tend to use the other end for non-stop um, so you kind of you bring the, the thin out the line by tipping the file over a little bit each way as you go um, and that that helps to round it off so we know that there's high spot here a high spot there and a high spot at the end so we expect those areas to require a little bit more careful work because there's more rounding to do um, but as I say as long as the little black line is preserved the marker pen line is, is carefully safeguarded down the middle of the fret then um, we still got the levelness that we had a minute ago when I stopped doing the leveling so we've preserved that and that's the main thing to look out for now the, the the line technically the thinner the line untouched line down the middle of these frets the better but there comes a point where sometimes you 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 can't keep going and you have to leave perhaps a little bit thicker line down the sen center of the fret than you wanted to um, it's not the end of the world it will play perfectly well very well um, it's just a nicety a technical nicety to narrow that line down you don't want ideally for your intonation to be perfectly as perfect as it can be you don't want the um, uh, you don't want the spot on the, the apex point of the where the string connects or contacts you don't want it to be flat and wide you you really do want it to be uh, as thin and as much like the top of a uh, top of an arch as possible so it's the smallest contact point and the ideal thing is that the, that contact point is in the center of the fret in, the, in that direction in that plane it needs to be right in the center and that's why that's why we do this recrowning business some factories these days for other for quite good reasons um, do a quick leveling of frets using a radius block um, and then polish up the frets and send the guitar out the door without re-crowning the frets and I can understand there's a it doesn't take much to work out why they do it that way um, you know they're, they're fighting or chasing really really tiny profit margins and um, to get somebody to stand here do this for an hour or half an hour or an hour with all the sanding and stuff polishing to get someone to do that would knock a hole in what's probably already you know a kind of stretched business model um, and so whatever to retain their profitability whether it's right or wrong they don't but and they and it used to be that they didn't do any leveling at all they just fret the thing out and get the guitar out the door and then 
whoever bought it would worry about taking it to a tech and trying to level it. But I think somebody realised along the way that if you did a radius block level before you sent it out the door, um, it was A, very quick, and B, technically, you didn't absolutely need to recrown it. You could just rub it up against the mm, buffer, get the frets all shiny, shine the fingerboard or whatever, if it was maple, and, and get it out the door. And it, on the plus, the very big plus side, it gave the owner, or the buyer, uh, the chance to immediately set a lower action and it, for it to be playable. On the negative side, um, what it did was, it, uh, when you looked up close at the frets, you could see that they were a little bit flattened um, and that nobody had crowned them, they just left them flat. And that technically would just slightly negatively impact on your um, intonation. Um, but again, for most people, intonation is anyway a subjective thing. It's very, very difficult to make an argument that it's a, an, an absolute thing and it changes between everybody who handles the uh, frets and the, uh, the strings and frets in a diff with a different pressure in a different way. So no two people ever handle it the same um, to begin with. And uh, so, uh, you know, the, the negative of losing that little bit of movement or getting a slightly inaccurate intonation as a result of not recrowning the frets properly is a, is a, is a minor negative point compared to the positive of a, a guitarist getting it out of the box um, and immediately being able to drop the action without a whole load of buzzing um, and choking, kicking off. Um, so that that's what I noticed they do. Um, you see what I'm doing here is I'm just, before I take the tape off, I'm, I'm just trying to get rid of as much of the um, black marker pen as possible before we remove, or not remove the tape, before we polish and sand sand and polish the frets out. So it makes the, softens up the paper a bit, but it should hold together while we do the sanding part. Um, this is naphtha. It's, it's called Coleman's Cooking Fuel, um, and it's harmless to nitro and to poly. And we just have to hope that they're telling the truth about that, because if it isn't, <laughs> we'll know. No, but it, 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 I've used it on millions of guitars, and it's it's well known in the guitar fixie world that naphtha is what you need. Although I have encountered ancient vintage, I mean 60s Japanese weird guitars which had a, a finish uh, in some parts, maybe the, I think it was in the knobs or something, the paint did come off with that stuff. So, um, right, so what I'm going to do is this is near the end of today's work. So I'm going to, uh, off camera, I think I'm going to uh, sand and polish out these frets and then remove the paper and um, just check all the finish and everything. Um, and then I'm going to just park it. And we won't come back to it until the bridge has arrived and we'll come back in and assess the bridge for replacing it and then setting a, a you know variation on the width. Okay, so this is me signing off for today. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see you back when the new bridge is arrived and we're fitting it. Such absolutely beautiful countryside. It's the perfect night. It's the perfect England on the perfect early summer night. With a beautiful blue sky above late early summer's evening. Birds tweeting, day burning away. And I'm heading to John's to drop off two guitars and then off to the workshop.
Okay, well, we've jumped forward a bit. Um, the bridge arrived today and it's in pieces right now because I've used it to mark up the new position or well, position of the new screws. And the interesting thing, because of the range or the reach of the bridge, um, it, it has to be back here to, uh, to get the correct intonation place. And it also has to be jammed up against this edge of the scratch plate, which we can modify if we want to, but I'm not sure I want to, no, well, no, we'll see. But anyway, um, the point is that what I've done is I've marked up the holes for this bridge in this position, and I have made sure that the string through holes work um, and lead up to a slightly different position. That's one of the biggest challenges you've got when you change a bridge, when you have a through hole bridge or through hole stringing. Now, what's great about this bridge, I don't know if you can see it there, but it comes with uh, to the right and lower than each of these larger uh, holes is a smaller hole there and that one is for the string th uh, string ball or the string to go through so this can be a top loading bridge so even if you can't get that alignment um, which I'm obviously trying to make sure that this thing sits with its saddles in a comfortable range of action um, and also uh, we want it to be if possible over the through holes um, if not though you can use it as a top loader which is a bit of a shame to lose the stringing so what i'm hoping for right now is once we put this on re refit all the bits over there and put it on there and um, we'll find that strings come up and we'll go through um as you can see i've kind of slightly just widened them a bit and that's given i've used a, a kind of sink um but just to give them a bit of backwards lean so that hopefully the strings will come up through there so i'm just going to carry on from this point onwards putting the bridge back together and i'll try and just keep you Keep you running, keep on running, yeah, something like that. So I'm not just yet going up too close and, uh, well, maybe I can. Oh, takes the bridge, takes the guitar, puts it off to one side. So what I can do, I suppose, is move things out of the way. And we've got the screws there, which we'll come back to. Uh, there's my strings that I was using for locating the uh, correct position. So what I'll do is I'll just, zoom in to here so I can re-fit the parts of this bridge and then we uh, no I have to do that when it's on no sorry um, just give me it's not easy to screw through this bridge so I have to put it on first um which is means we just have to commit to it uh, sorry I'm so sorry it's a Saturday evening it's quite late it's just been as you saw out in the countryside and that little trip was to deliver guitars to um, a friend and customer of mine named John um, and so it was just a pleasure to drive through the Devonshire countryside okay we've got a long one there we don't want that so we've got four through screws and we've got some additional uh, what do they call them I don't even know what they call them uh, some additional Grub screws. Now, this these are very tiny mounting screws for this bridge, um, and it would suggest that a one and a half millimeter hole for the I'll drill bit for the thingy hole, pilot hole, is probably the right way to go. Let's start and see. One, two, three, and already marked up. So I'm, I'm trying to keep these small to begin with because I don't want to um, I don't want them too loose because they are pretty darned small. Okay, and that looks like it should go. So what we'll do is we've we're, we're touching the ground wire still, which is fine. Let's get this one here. These are quite flat screws so let's start with this one here and help it into place and we'll space it with the other ones now to get the most movement we, we've got to push that up against the push the bridge new position up against the scratch plate we may take it off later or whatever and make a slight adjustment but right now or you know add a bit of 
take away a bit of the plate but right now it's got to go in dead on the thing so because otherwise it wouldn't we'd be wasting our time fitting this bridge because we're, we're trying to make the most of the um, change in bridge position So let's get these all the way in. I'll take it down to two. It's probably too much right now. Yeah, three. Okay, that one's strangely a little bit. That's okay. Thinking that one's just a little bit off to one side, but that's fine. So that's a, that is a really solid fit. Now we have to do the slow bit, which is to refit each one of these pieces and then we have to line up on the um, line up on the saddle here and then we'll, we'll line up for the uh, to get it intonated to the right place now this will only be a sort of test st starter intonation um, so I've got a written, a written pencil mark which is where I want it to begin with and then I'll track everything back from there and hopefully this will still work within this thing and then of course finally last thing of all we'll find out whether the string through is going to accommodate we can make the holes larger in the bottom of the bridge as well there's no reason not to it requires a bit of careful uh, sanding of the um, holes to, to make sure they don't come through ragged um, but this is it's a beautifully made thing i'm really happy with this piece of kit and I could see once I put it together already that the it was going to work and, and re, you know, give us back the uh, the extra couple of mil. So now the, the, what happens is the middle ones I haven't spaced yet. I've just spaced the outer ones to to the fifty. Oh come on, damn it! The fifty millimeter uh, spacing. So the inner ones we're going to have to just work around or play around with. Um, a little bit difficult to do because you've got to get down in front with a hex key a little tiny hex key so the bridge the bridge is naturally designed for the I suppose you'd probably say a 52 and a half millimeter spread or 53 halfway between its possibles so its possibles are 50 to 56 so we we, we expect that um, it's halfway in the middle um, but it means that because we're going to the 50 version, it means that the outer strings are going to lean in a little bit. There's no way around that, but it'll only between, be between the through hole and the saddle, and it's not gonna cause any problems. So what I'm just hoping now, or making sure, is that this thing tightens up nicely within the range of space. Now, it may be advisable to just cut down the spring a tiny bit. I think we're, we're not quite on the mark here um, I, i'll know better when i've strung it up you see so i think we better be prepared to put a set of thingy strings on sacrificial that looks a bit of a, a, a big range of adjustment um so that's that's actually now at its at its stop so we have a, a, tr a tricky problem we've we've got to give it its uh range and we've got to get it over the holes correctly so um, let's see where we get to. Put a mill on each one. So forward with this one a bit. Oops, wrong way. Forward with this one. And forward with that one. And that one's. I think we should be about on the mark there. That looks pretty good. Like I say, we'll only really know when we are loaded up. So let's see if we can. Mm, this is never going to work. Right, these are. Right, let's find something I can use. Let's do it. Let's waste a set of these if we've got the whole lot. Yeah, we've got the whole lot. Right, we'll, we'll spend a set of. Now, this is the fun part. This is where we find out whether the string through part of it is going to work the way we need it to. I wouldn't be surprised if it makes some or puts up some resistance to uh going through but we shall see we may be it may be more cooperative well look at that 
Oh yes, far more quaffed than I expected. So I'm gonna get the do wrapper winder. Save me, oh, come on, speed me along. Um, now um, it's a bit messy here, I will tidy up after this, but let's just get all these first set of strings on and be confident at least that we don't have to make any major scale length alterations. Uh, no, you absolute plonker. Here's, I've been doing left-handed guitar so long that I've just cut this to left-handed length. Idiot. Thankfully, I've got two spare ones here. <sighs> anyway, I've just, uh, just had um, an interesting, well, not an annoying uh, comment on the uh, this YouTube the other day, yesterday, after, I knew I would, after putting up the Fender uh, custom shop setup, um, I kind of made, at the beginning of that video, I made a, uh, a statement about um, you know, people who turn up and tell you you're doing something wrong or call you, a, you know, complain that you're waffling or whatever, I'm waffling or whatever. And I just sort of said, look, it, if you don't like it, go somewhere else. This works for me, etc., etc." And um, lo and behold, uh, I got a sort of version of that turn up on that page because it was about, uh, on that video, because of course it was about, um, uh, what do you call it, um, this expensive fender, which, which is going to attract attention with some problems, you know. And so as soon as you do anything about a guitar for which there are plenty of fanboys who, and they're fanboys because they, they, they believe in its perfectness without any evidence. They just, they've decided the custom shop, Fender custom shop equals this. There cannot be any flaws or faults with it. And anyone like me who thinks there is, must be uh, an idiot or a liar or a cheat, or it must be paid by someone or whatever. So they, they make it their business to go and, share with the world their understanding. This this person decided that the, uh, the metal filings, which were actually swore, right? Proper magnetic swore from, from ferrous steel. This person decided that those things that I found on the uh, pickup magnets, the minute I opened the, the guitar and took it out of the case, he, just, he declared on my in the comments of the video, that that was my fault for, um, oh, that's interesting, that's better, in you go. Decided it was my fault for, um, that it was uh, the result of me leveling the frets and therefore I put that there. Uh, you know, and I just thought, do you know what? I'll just show you how wrong you are. So I pointed out that, that A, it was there when I opened the uh, guitar case, so it couldn't be me. And B, the second thing is, I've set up and fret leveled a couple of thousand guitars easily, and I know exactly what fret leveling dust looks like, and I also know that it's not magnetic. You know, and I've had people before demanding why I don't cover up all the pickups all the time while I'm leveling. And instead of, instead of uh, taking the easy option, right, it, which is to assume that the reason I don't is because it doesn't need it, Right? People like to assume that I'm wrong because it makes them feel good for a split second of time. So this person did that same as the usual, same old, same old. Uh, so I just pointed it out that it, they were wrong in every sense of their assessment. And I just wish that they would go and find something that they could enjoy instead of being critical of something that I know what I'm doing. Um, and I, you know, it's, uh, I don't actually get annoyed about it. I just think it's a real shame. And uh, in part, because they, they, you know, they obviously think they're, they're, they're getting a buzz from being right in their minds. And so, you know, they pop up and tell you how wrong you are. And, uh, you know, it's obvious that they don't know what they're talking about. And, it's not, a, it's not a matter of um, opinions versus one opinion versus another. It's just a proof, demonstrable fact they're wrong, you know. Um, and then, so I pointed it out, those two things, and then the person came back again to say, ah, yes, but uh, nickel, nickel has some magnetism, 
Uh, and then if you look at the nickel component of frets, it's it's also minimal, and so on and so on. You know, it, it's not. So so you could argue that nickel has a tiny trace magnetism. And if you look at Google and Wikipedia, it's only a, it's only mildly, vaguely magnetic. But you'll notice that nickel is no more than 18% of the compound or the, the sub alloy anyway. You know, so blah, 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 blah. It is not going to. And, and also, the other thing I didn't even bother saying is that fret filing, fret um, leveling dust is dust. It is not squarf like filings. Right? Now, if you were to do your frets with wire wall, yes, that stuff does stick to your uh, pickups because it's ferrous. It's magnetic. Right, now this sits onto the thing. Now those, okay, so look, we have a, we have a result in terms of the um, positioning. Right? We are now have a lot more space on this high E. Um, and that's actually balance, balancing, balancing, that's currently balancing both strings, the, both high E's exactly. So we would also have the option if we had to, to privilege it more towards the high E and push it towards the low E, but I've decided not to do that. I've tried to keep it balanced dead on. So I'm just going to basically tune these up and I'm going to do a very quick intonation test to make sure we are where I think we should be. These bridges actually are far less forgiving of positioning than you really imagine, so uh, if you get it wrong you can run out. Now, what we don't know, this is a different shaped height bridge. I don't actually know what the action is right now. It's probably a bit low. It could even be a bit too low. I don't know. I'll worry about that in a minute. So what I'm going to care about first, before I do a cleanup, is I'm going to test the intonation as quickly as I can. We've got people uh, who hear the bikes tonight. They're using this space as a meet meet up place, I don't know what's happening or they're going out to a gig or something or they will meet from across the country but no, I'd be happy if this is a bit long. It seems to be dead on actually. It is dead on. Oh yeah, right on the mark. It's too low probably on the action, but we'll take care of that bit in a minute. Just in terms of intonation, we're spot on. So I can take my marker off now Ooh. Uh, and I uh, will clean up. Uh, well, first I'm gonna have a feel of this. No, let's let's do that adjustment now so I don't feel freaked out that I'm not getting a good play out of this since I've already set it up with the precision leveling. It makes me nervous that I'm I'm hearing it choke out, but that's because it's below a millimeter in terms of its uh, height. So I'm going to do what this is meant to do, which is raise up. It's quite simple, just like a regular strap thingy. Just on the mark, beautiful. 
Okay, too low again. So everything is a fraction too low. I think it's about half a mil, so I'm going to tweak everything half a mil, if I'm right. Mind you, I don't know what the rate radius is they've set these set, uh, grub screws to, but I'll just tweak away. This is a bit low. It's okay. Too low. So this is pretty good. I'm I'm very pleased. First, it, first thing is of course is we've got all of the um, strings through the hole, through the through holes without any problems at all. So that's a very really good uh, thing. I mean it. It is. You have to just be a little cool, careful. It won't. It is, but it's not anywhere near. I would call a problem. Second thing is we've got in the range of intonation spot on. We've got in what I we've we've gained back the distance on the high E. We've now got more spare, um, and we've got the bridge positioned uh, where I want it to be. Now I've brought this in, but I could technically. Um, push. We've now. Uh, I, I've brought the uh, high E in, um, and we could push it a little bit. And, you know, we will balance it out in a minute because it's not quite right. But, or actually, sorry, the high E is in the right place. But we've got to balance the other ones. But um, you know, if we if we ever needed any more out of the uh, space for the high E, then the only way we we're going to get that is to cut a bit more away here and move a tiny bit more again, which I. And I would hope we don't need to do. It's all possible with the filling of holes, but the problem with this is, you see, you can only get it right once, hopefully, and that's your go. And then you, you measure it and measure it and, and test with um, dummy strings and so on, and you get it as close as you can. But if you don't get it right, you, you then are into a bit more, slightly ser not serious, but you're into a bit more work, filling and redrilling things but again it is possible it's not beyond the means of human beings so you can see I've raised all of these up a bit because they've all gone sharp. Ooh, yeah. See, any string can fall off the end of any guitar. Um, but this has improved the amount of space available. Um, now the only question I've got is would we push it even further by the tune of about a millimetre to the outside because this is now operating at the narrowest fitment um, and that it will still uh, we can still use the same um, we we'll still use the same uh, through holes because they, they will work with this. Um, the only question is, do we go a millimeter further? And the question is, can we can we afford the extra millimeter on this side? Started off by balancing it. I can't tell um, if this is enough. I could play this all day long. You know, it's not gonna. You can push it. Question is, do I go off balance to give the E high E back another bit more, or do I 
you know we've gained we've gained a millimeter and a half already I could could throw it another millimeter by repositioning the bridge a fraction with a bit of a uh, bit of a modification on the pick guard because that's the only way I'm going to get more out so at the moment I haven't modified it but I physically would have to modify it now to move it oh my back to one side um, so to do it that brings the edge of the scratch plate, uh, scratch plate closer to the screw as well which isn't impossible or illegal but you have to just be aware of that so this would come down here and it would come around the corner so and then you would cut it down there's music playing they're having a party it's like the party at the beginning of um uh, Rocky Horror. Okay, so with this marked up, I could do that anyway, make that, you know, shape that, and then I do have an opportunity, an option, to move this in a tiny fraction. I could also measure and respace these by using measurements because they're a little bit off the middle ones. Actually, they don't look that far off. I did them, I visually uh, guessed them. Actually, they're almost right, apart from that one's probably a bit too far that way. Um, but I can line them up and measure them as we go. So the question is, do we re, do we fill these little holes now, reposition and move it to give ourselves, we, we're going to one millimeter to the side. It's not a lot of movement. We're okay on this direction. Um, we don't want to be any further forward. Do we want to be, let me just check. Let's see how much further forward we could go if we wanted to it's not that kind of fitting Samuel um yeah we I'm going to lose I've lost that's why we're giving us one of these and oh, no, I've got mine there it is so in terms of this one how much further forward can I go without losing it right we can go to there um and reaching forward so I think I'm thinking out loud. Um, bring it back to here. So the mark is there. No, the, see, that's the problem. If we go forward with that, then we have to bring the whole bridge that way. Uh, do we? No. If we go forward, we have to push the bridge that way, and it loses connection with the through, string through. That's why I put it where I have. I'm not mad. I'm just thinking through. There's a, there's a reason I did what I did. Okay, so the thing, that's fine where it is. We've just got to keep everything in line, but we could move it a millimeter to the side to give, go on, let's do it. In for a penny, in for a pound. Okay, I'm going to do it off camera because I'm going to listen to the radio. It's a Saturday night, um, but you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tidy up in between. So I'll see you after I've done that. When I'm putting some new strings on, we'll be nearly done. Well, sorry about that. Um, folks, I, it's late on a Saturday night, so I've done the repositioning of the bridge. And the new bridge how cool does that look look at that baby and i've spaced the strings pretty well um but i can also recheck it just to make sure at home what i've done is as you probably saw i've decided to privilege uh, where's the lens i've decided to privilege the treble side over the bass side bass side we tend to pull downwards more than anything else with our fingers um Whereas this side, we the subway do the same with this one, but that's where it runs out. Um, so I've given the I've given deliberately given more room so that Mark gets a playable guitar out of it. That's a really important thing of all of this. It's you know I did have it originally as you saw at equal uh, spacing for each side, but I've I've now opted to go for extra room just because this problem um, you know this was Mark's problem from the beginning. So. There we go. I'm going to call that done. Um, I will take some uh, strings home with me because I'm going to either fit a set of nines or tens. I can't remember. I was waiting for an email. I'll hear back from him to know which one to fit. And then I will fit whichever one um, and stretch them out and, and check the intonation at home. But you can see it's, pretty, it's already pretty much spot on from where we did it before. So that's it. That's the interesting uh, situation. Um, it's not 
I have to say, and I think you saw this from the first part of the video, it's not absolutely as low as um, uh, all the other strats or, you know, uh, as some strats that I've done, not all, but some strats. And it surprised me a little bit, this guitar. I was not impressed with the amount of work I had to do on the neck. Um, and I hate to say this, you know, because it, it's not a criticism of the person who bought the guitar um, at all, but it, that, as you remember earlier on, that, that took a lot of work, that neck. And it's still not perfect, but I don't want to take any more fret metal. Um, you know, I wanted to kind of set with a compromise of about 1.5 millimeters here. And I think that's the best decision to do. It's, a, it's always a judgment call. So that's it for tonight. I hope you enjoyed this strange and interesting one. This is this has got currently got some uh, cheap Chinese strings on, but we are using we've kept the uh, retained the string through. You know everything else is exactly as it was, um, except we've now got a load of extra room on the treble side to play with. Thankfully, okay. So thanks for watching, and um, see you on the next one.